go. Well, good evening, all. We're glad you're with us. Um, we hope that uh, you all survived um, our tropical storm this past weekend and didn't have much, if any, damage um, to your homes and congregations. Um, I'm just uh, here to kind of kick this off a little bit. Um, we were invited to host this webinar. Um, Steve contacted Pastor Tom, who said, well, I think you should talk to Terry and uh, provide this as a resource for our congregations um, about what the ELCA offers with financial um, uh, resource for servants um, financial program. And so tonight will just be kind of an intro into that. And um, again, this is all free. You do this at your own pace and Steve will explain more. Steve and I worked together years ago on um, building missional capacity I think there were a few more words in that title, but uh, <laughs> so. Yeah. so I'm going to hand this off to Steve and he can introduce himself and let you know what we're, what you're going to learn tonight. Great. Well, thank you, Terry. And thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Um, I always like to start by saying thank you because uh, it's people like you that make things happen. And I, I, I like to say that it always takes at least one person to step forward uh, as a leader to get something organized, to pull something together, to pay attention to details and to make things happen. And I know in my congregation, sometimes when I'm talking to the pastor, we say, if only people knew all the things that have to happen behind the scenes to do what we do, all of those details, right? Um, and uh, sometimes we do it so well, we say we make it look too easy and um, people just don't fully understand all of the stuff that goes on. So I know you folks are those kinds of people and you're immersed in uh, a lot of the financial details of your congregation. And so I just wanna say thank you for the difference that you make uh, and what you make possible uh, at your congregation. So a little bit about myself, I'm a lay person. Uh, I grew up as a, as a PK, uh, but uh, I studied uh, engineering and economics. I had a business of my own and I was uh, literally minding my own business when my pastor at my congregation called me about 10 years ago and he told me about a stewardship position at the ELCA. I live uh, about uh, on halfway in between Chicago and Milwaukee and so the ELCA headquarters are uh, about a half hour away and uh, so my pastor told me about this job and I was kind of curious about it, so I looked into it and kind of had a, a shift in, in career and and uh, really enjoyed it. I was able to make a few trips out your way, and uh, that's when I met Terry and, and Pastor Tom. Uh, it's the only time I've been to Southern California. I flew in and out of John Wayne Airport there and um, had uh, had some great uh, uh, conversations with uh, people in your, your synod and different congregations and stuff. Um, I've since uh, stopped working at the ELCA, although this project is one thing that I'm still connected with, and I work full-time for my congregation. My position is uh, Director of Operational Ministries, and so our congregation has a child care, it has a preschool, uh, we have about 50 employees, 40 of those are connected to the, the child care and preschool, and there's just a lot of different things that, that go on. Um, in the last few years since I've been working full time there, we've we've dealt with COVID. We've dealt with our senior pastor of 32 years retiring. Uh, we've had uh, HVAC units that have gone down in the middle of winter and uh, water mains that have been leaking underground and trying to figure out where the leaks are at and just all sorts of details that I'm sure uh, you're familiar with uh, as you've been leading in your congregations. So it's always kind of interesting to me to think about what happens in congregation congregations and, and what it takes and the combinations of different things that 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 go on. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Zig Ziglar, um, he's not with us anymore, but he was a motivational speaker. One time I was listening to Zig as riding in the car and Zig said something like, you know, the most important thing that that my business does is make money. And 
it caught my attention and I thought, well, it's, I'm kind of curious where he's going to go with this. Um, and he went on to say that money was not the, the end of what they were trying to do, but it was a means. And it was by making money that they were able to serve their customers. It was by making money that they were able to make a difference in the community. It was by making money that they could take care of their employees. And obviously in the church, our goal is not to be making money, but we understand how money flows through so many different things that we do. And so uh, the practices that we have around taking care of money and stewarding it and um, engaging in best practices really matters a lot. Uh, another way that I sort of think about this too is uh, thinking about the difference between knowing how to cook and knowing how to run a restaurant. I don't know if you've ever thought about uh, the difference between those two things. And they're, they're, they're different skill sets, even though they're, they're things that are interrelated with each other, right? And sometimes I think um, in the church, we, we have a fallacy that it's more about the cooking part than it is the running the restaurant part. And yet we all understand that if the restaurant doesn't stay in business, then it kind of takes away the opportunity to do the cooking. And uh, so it's, it's people like us who help the restaurant part of what we do in church uh, stay in business and be able to be there so that when we, when we cook and we feed people spiritually and physically, uh, we can keep doing that and, and scale that up. So this particular uh, initiative uh, is a partnership with the Lilly Endowment. And I like to uh, refer to the Lilly Endowment as kind of a bright spot in the world of organized religion. They have a lot of money and they're giving it away quite generously uh, across different denominations to help uh, the religious industrial complex, if you will, figure out how to do church better. And the way they go about it is not so much telling you what the answer is, but giving you the money to do some experiments. And so Resourceful Servants is the name of the project that the ELCA has with uh, Lilly Endowment. And there's two parts to it. One part has to do with uh, pastors and their per personal financial situations. And the other part of the Resourceful Servants Project is, is the one that we're going to talk about tonight, the Congregational Financial Assessment. And initially, when we put this together, um, it was conceived of as sort of like a, a, almost like a good housekeeping seal of approval, kind of a certificate type program that if congregations did these best practices, it would be a good thing that would lead to financial health. And um, as we got into it more and we talked with different people and, and had kind of an earlier version and then kind of updated it and that sort of thing, we sort of changed the focus to be more about the idea that your members, your donors, your supporters uh, want you to steward their gifts in the best possible way. And one of the ways that you can signal or tell them that you take that responsibility seriously is by engaging in best practices around how you handle money. And um, in the same way that, that a corporation or other organizations would use these best practices, uh, it's a way of being transparent, being open, um, saying that professionalism in how you handle gifts matters and you take it seriously. And so what we did was we identified 21 best practices. There isn't anything magical about that number 21. Um, we were thinking that was a place to start and it could grow to 30 or 40, but 21 is where it's at. And the 21 are organized into five different categories. So we have, have a category for human resources. We have a category for accounting, finance, risk management, and stewardship. And then, um, we sort of thought to, in, in an earlier version, it was kind of like, almost like a pass fail sort of thing. And then we had a change of heart as we got into it further, 
that it really should be more about incremental improvement with the idea that any improvement greater than zero is a victory. And um, I was just uh, listening to uh, an author who has uh, written this book called Atomic Habits. Maybe you've heard of it. And uh, James Clear is talking, telling a story about a guy who lost 100 pounds. And the way he did it was he started out by telling himself he was going to go to the gym, but he was only going to stay for five minutes. And you sort of think like, okay, what's the point of going to the gym and only staying for five minutes? But the point was, is starting to build habits um, and being less concerned about having the perfect program. And so what James Clear was sort of su suggesting is sometimes we, we worry about how to do things perfectly when what we really should focus on are building the incremental habits to start getting into something. And so it was through this process of going to the gym for five minutes that uh, eventually it grew to something bigger than that and, and allowed this, this man to lose 100 pounds. So one of the things that we're hoping for with this uh, congregational financial assessment is maybe it's the kind of tool that allows you to sort of uh, push back from the urgent, um, all of the th all of the fires that you might be dealing with, and have a chance to ask some questions, to think about the bigger picture, think about maybe some opportunities to improve certain areas of how you do things. And again, any any incremental improvement greater than zero is a victory. Um, it is about practices as well as uh, you know compet competency around those practices. So you know it's it's one thing to know about how to do an audit; it's another thing to actually do it, right? And so um, the 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 assessment is about engaging in in the practices. And um, sometimes uh, people say, well, you know, how many people should be involved in, in doing this self-assessment? And I say, usually there's two to three people in every congregation who are kind of in the know about how things work and can go through and answer the questions uh, around this assessment. Um, it is a self-assessment. So it's, it's you and your team answering these questions uh, about yourselves. It's not somebody from the outside telling you um, how you're doing. Um, and so it's a matter of kind of going through and, and being honest with yourself and thinking of uh, the, the, the way the scoring works is anywhere from we don't do this practice, which is the lowest score, to we do it, but we're not really feeling so great about how we do it. Uh, and then from there, the, the next highest one is we do it and we feel pretty good about it. And the last one is, is we do it and we don't really think that there's, you know, a lot of room for improvement. Um, so that's the way that works. And as you're doing this assessment behind the scenes, it's sort of keeping track of, of the score and you can go back and do it over time and you can see how your score changes. So the goal again is to get better at what at what you're doing. So I'm gonna pull up the website and just walk through with you uh, what is there and how it works and give you a little taste of, of what we've put together. Again, as Terry was saying, this is all free to you. It's been paid for by the Lilly Endowment. So um, it's just a matter of going there and getting into it and spending some time with it. Uh, to set up an account, you will need to know your congregational ID number as well as the password uh, that goes with that. Typically, when you get the uh, parochial report, uh, the, it has that information at the top. And I think the passwords from the last, I don't know, five or six years will work. Typically, if you can't uh, find where that's at. Someone in the Synod can help you with that, or you can reach out to me. Uh, Terry's raising her hand. She knows that information. So any questions so far? We doing all right? Okay. Let me see if I can pull this up here. 
hoping everybody can see that. So you can get to this website on your own at resourcefulservants.org, resourcefulservants.org. And the branch that we're going to be looking at is this congregations branch. And so when you go there, uh, there's kind of an overview that talks about the program. It talks about these five categories of, of practices that I was mentioning to you, accounting, finance, human resources, risk management, and stewardship. We've got a little video here, a testimonial from a pastor whose congregation went through the program, and I'll share that at the end with you. It's a, quite a nice little video. But um, this is the chance where you can go then and look at each of these practices. You can also get to the practices through this, this congregation and the drop down menu. And I'm going to move this over here so I can see better. And so if I go here, you can see all of the practices that are part of the accounting category. So I'll go to the first one, accounting system. Uh, a lot of this stuff is going to be pretty uh, pretty basic. Um, and so if you look at this one, there's a, a little bit of an explanation around why an accounting system is important. Uh, there are resources. So every single practice has identified some resources. It's not meant to be exhaustive. It's meant to be anywhere from three to 10 resources that if you wanted to do a deeper dive, you could pull these up and look at you know, what, what they have to tell you. Um, another thing that we were thinking about is um, the challenge of when you get to that place where you need to train new people to be part of the team, new generations of people, how do you get them up to speed on the different things that you do, the things that you pay attention to? And hopefully some of these resources will be the sorts of things that will help you uh, to do that. So uh, some of these things are things that you've probably seen before. So if I click on this one here, this is from the ELCA, Congregational Treasurer and Bookkeepers, Finance and Accounting Guide, all sorts of stuff here that's put together uh, and maintained by, by our denomination. As I go further down into this page uh, about this practice of accounting, Another part that we have for each one of the practices is sort of a discussion board. And the idea here is that uh, all of you are really the experts. And what we want to do is promote sharing of information between all of you with each other. And uh, this idea came to us through uh, something that I had read about with a website called Diabetes Daily. And what they found out is that when people were able to share information with each other uh, relative to, to their diabetes um, and what they were experiencing with diet and exercise and medication and all that sort of stuff, they were better informed uh, than they were when they relied just on conversations with their doctor. And all of us have the potential of sharing the things that we've learned how we do things, uh, tricks of the trades, so to speak. And so this discussion area is meant to be a place where that could happen. And so uh, as an example of that, one of the things that I did here is I, I posted a little thing. Uh, right before we uh, had COVID, our congregation switched over to the online version of QuickBooks, which worked out very well for us. And um, But the little piece of information that I wanted to share is that there's an organization called TechSoup. And I don't know if you're familiar with TechSoup, but what TechSoup does is it actually verifies nonprofit status, which then opens the door for getting discounts on software and hardware. Many tech companies, they want to support nonprofits and give them deals. They just need some way of verifying that you are actually a nonprofit. That's what TechSoup does. So I think in the in the case of QuickBooks, it's uh, QuickBooks Online. It's through TechSoup. I want to say it's one hundred and fifty dollars a year versus if you tried to get it on your own without TechSoup, it's maybe like seventy, eighty dollars a month, something like that. So it's 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 quite a discount. 
Um, and so I put this in here just as a way of, of uh, providing an example of how this sort of uh, discussion forum could be helpful. Again, I feel like people like you, you have learned a lot of things through your experience and how you do things and being able to share that um, is, is really key for uh, benefiting from the wisdom of the crowd, so to speak. So each of the practices has that. And um, as I was saying here, you can see all of the different practices uh, under uh, finance, uh, managing debt, um, again, a little bit of a description, some resources, the discussion area. And uh, I've got an area for stewardship and we've got three different practices there. And then in terms of the doing the assessment itself, that's this branch here about tracking progress. And so if I go and if I've set up an account um, and once you do that, you will be able to invite uh, a few other people to be part of your team um, if, if you would like to do that. Each one of the categories has its own page that goes through all of the practices in that category. And then this is where you get to choose between um, how, you, how you feel like you're doing, okay? So for annual audit practice, yeah, we don't really do an annual audit. No, we do it, but we need quite a bit of improvement. We do it, we need a little bit of improvement, or I think we, we do this one pretty well, okay? And so as you go through those and you go from one page uh, with category to the next category and you answer those, eventually you get to the end. And when you get to the end, you can see the dashboard. And the dashboard shows you your score. And if you come back and do it over time, you'll see how your score changes, okay? And again, so the goal isn't pass fail, the goal is improvement. Um, some people will go through those, uh, the uh, assessment pages and they'll print those out and take those to a church council meeting and say like, hey, here's, here's some of the things that we're talking about and we're thinking about. And what we're trying to do is identify maybe some low hanging fruit. We're trying to identify what might be one practice that would make a lot of sense for us to spend a little time and see if we might be able to improve how we do things a little bit, tighten it up, uh, make some progress. So that's that's what it's all about. Any, any questions at this point? I'm gonna, let's see here, stop share. I've got more to show you, but any any questions so far? All right. So one of the things that's really interesting to me is behind the scenes, I can see um, how congregations are assessing themselves. And what we can do is we can organize uh, scores across congregations look at the average score practice by practice, and then sort it and say, which are the practices that across all the congregations that are participating uh, are the highest scores on average and which are the lowest scores? And one way to think about that is the average scores that are the highest are the practices that we feel most confident about that we're doing a pretty good job. On the other end of the spectrum, the practices that have the lowest average scores are the ones that we feel least confident about in terms of how we're carrying out those. And I'm going to show you that list. It's kind of interesting. I think you'll find it to be pretty intuitive. Um, and it's, uh, well, let me, let me pull it up. And let's see here. Um, go back here. So um, here's what that list looks like. And so it's all of the practices, all 21 practices, okay? 
And these are over here on the right. These are the average score for that practice across the congregations that went through and did the assessment. Okay. And I've sorted it from the highest average scores at the top to the lowest average scores at the bottom. So the practices at the top are things like payroll processing, having an accounting system, uh, compliance with taxes and um, pay standards within the denomination, uh, benefits management, and uh, process for counting, tracking, reporting donations. When you think about that, those are things, if we don't do those very well, it turns out that, that people who are paid by the congregation, if they're not getting paid, if they're not getting paid accurately, they're usually not too happy about that, right? Um, and so um, in terms of the squeaky wheel getting the grease, we're going to hear some squeaking and, and we're going to address those things. The same with having the uh, basic accounting system, benefits management. Uh, it turns out our donors like statements that reflect their giving, that sort of thing. So I think those things at the top are pretty intuitive. What's really interesting to me is the stuff at the other end of the spectrum in terms of the, the practices that we feel least confident about. Um, and so uh, maybe kind of how we track our property um, and inventory that and think about that in terms of uh, insurance and maintenance and that sort of stuff. But then all three of the stewardship categories uh, or, or practices are at the bottom. So this idea of having an annual plan, how is it that we engage people in being excited about supporting the ministries of our congregation? Well, it turns out we don't feel super confident about that. Um, understanding mission support, that's a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, I know from my own congregation, I was at a council meeting uh, at the end of the year one time, and the person who was presenting the proposed budget was going through the various line items, and he got to the line item for mission support, and it was described as, this is the 10% that we have to pay the denomination. And um, after he was done, I, I said, you know, if we could just go back and talk about that a little bit, because um, I think it would be helpful for people to understand that uh, through the denomination, we have a ministry partner that helps us to do even more things than we do ourselves in terms of Lutheran colleges, uh, Lutheran social services, or seminaries, campus ministries, all of these different ministry partners that happen through the denomination. And that is our mechanism for helping those ministries to happen. Um, the next one up on the list, provide expanded giving options. You know, as people uh, don't carry cash anymore, as checks are going away, how do we help people to give in other sorts in other sorts of ways? So uh, in my congregation, one of the things that we're experimenting with at the moment is uh, kind of like a Vanco for, uh, doing stock gifts, uh, appreciated assets, uh, legacy gifts, and um, it's kind of interesting. We just had somebody, uh, we've only been, uh, the, the name of the platform is called Freewill, freewill.com, and uh, the reason for the name is when you get connected to their platform, which is not free, uh, your members and people in your community can use it to create a free will by going through and answering some questions. Uh, but it also gives you a mechanism for people to be able to name your congregation uh, as uh, part of their estate as a, a legacy gift and to let you know about that. So this would be an example of expanded giving options. And the reason I brought this up, we've only been with it for uh, maybe about four or five months. And we just had somebody who um, let us know that they've designated a, as part of their estate, a gift of $75,000. Wow. And um, so how do we, you know, cultivate these sorts of 
these sorts of uh, opportunities for other kinds of giving. And just, um, you know, in general, I, I find it kind of interesting, and I, I guess part of this goes back to my days of, of working on, on stewardship staff, is we feel co confident in terms of handling the money, less confident about how we engage people to give it in the first place. And I just wanted to share this uh, this quote from, from Henry Nowen. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, but it's quite nice. It it inspires me to when I come back to it every once in a while. Henry Noun was a Catholic priest, and he wrote he wrote a book called The Spirituality of Fundraising. And I'll just read the first few sentences. Fundraising is precisely the opposite of begging. And I think so many times when we think about uh, going to our members and talking about money, there's sort mm -hmm. of this feeling of awkwardness, like somehow we're begging. But Henry Nowen says, it's the opposite of begging. When we seek to raise funds, we are not saying, please, could you help us out? Because lately it's been hard. Rather, we are declaring, we have a vision that is amazing and exciting. And we are inviting you to invest yourself through the resources that God has given you, your energy, your prayers, and your money in this work to which God has called us. Um, I really like that uh, perspective that in our congregations, we have some real exciting ministries. We have a vision for how we'd like to make the world a better place. And we are inviting people to be part of that and to invest in it. Questions, comments, observations? Yes. Thank you very much for, I, I'm assuming you, you were talking. Yes. Okay. Quick question on the free will. When you said one of your uh, congregants had made a designation for it, is it a, a guided or a direct, like we want this to go to the mortgage or we want this to go to the general operating? Can they do that? Uh, do you know? If there are different categories that when you get connected to the platform that you can specify, like these are different opportunities that people can give to. In the case okay. of this particular gift, I'm not sure what they specified, but well, I'm I, sure that I don't need to know yeah. that specific yeah. gift. I mean, just in general. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anybody else? So the last thing that I wanted to show you was just this little uh, testimonial video from Pastor Dan Solomon. And um, I'll end with that. And then, you know, if there are any other questions, um, I can answer those. Um, otherwise, I'm also available after the fact. And and uh, Terry has my contact information. And I'm sure that, um, you know, any any questions that you might have, we can find a way to get those answered for you. But uh, let me pull up this video. It's it's quite nice. Let's see. Greetings. I'm Pastor Dan Solomon. I serve as senior pastor at Augustana Lutheran Church in Boone, Iowa. And I want to share with you a bit about the impact that the Congregational Financial Assessment has had on the life and ministry of our congregation. Now, I have a firm conviction that it has grown out of my 35 years of ministry in the midst of several congregations of the importance of good, transparent, financial practices. Now, good financial practices are not sufficient in and of itself to have a vital ministry, but they are necessary to have a vital transformational ministry. Now, when I came here to Augustana some years ago, they had very solid financial practices. What I found was lacking a bit was transparency. That is, 
congregational finances were kind of a black box. And sometimes this led to adversarial or scarcity thinking or people thinking us versus them. Well, over the years, adding greater measure of transparency has helped us grow the perspective of abundance and interdependence and trust. Now, the Congregational Financial Assessment has benefited the leadership within the congregation I serve in a couple ways. First, it gave the occasion to pause, to reflect, to evaluate, to think about how are we doing in these specific areas and these specific practices, and then have a broader conversation. So it doesn't just involve the congregational treasurer. It goes beyond that to maybe the finance committee and other people involved in leadership positions, looking to see if there are any gaps, any things that need to be updated or tweaked. And then the assessment, the website, provides resources to address those areas that are identified. And even to ask questions, to become a part of a community, a conversation, to together develop more sound and transparent financial uh, practices. So the Congregational Financial Assessment benefits the congregation that I serve in so many ways. First of all, and this may seem really self-obvious, it helps ensure that money and finances are handled properly, above reproach. And I think that's important, maybe even more important, in a day like we find ourselves in now. And it has helped build a climate of trust and openness, for instance, as we're building a budget. Or when we go to the congregation with a financial need, whether it is our annual narrative budget or a capital campaign for things like a parking lot or HVAC or a new roof or for world hunger or for the ELCA youth gathering, whatever it is, that our people, if they choose to respond, know that their gifts will be handled properly. But this climate of trust and openness also goes kind of broader and deeper. It engenders a deeper participation in God's mission. It encourages the growth of disciples. So the benefits of being involved with the Congregational Financial Assessment goes way beyond finances into all the aspects of ministry of our congregation. And it frees up, it opens up our congregation for faithful, generous, open-handed ministry. These are just some of the ways that the Congregational Financial Assessment has benefit, benefited the leadership and the ministry of the congregation I serve. Thanks. Peace. So hopefully, um, you know, when you hear about uh, 21 practices, you don't hear something that sounds overwhelming uh, because really what it's meant to be is an invitation to find something where you can start, something very small, um, to say, you know what, Here, here's an opportunity that maybe uh, represents some low-hanging fruit that we could we could do something a little different, a little better, uh, tighten some things up, try a new approach. And um, as I said before, any progress greater than zero is a victory. So it's not about mastering all 21 and overwhelming before I even start. It's the equivalent of that five minutes going to the gym thinking about maybe some new habits, some new practices, some new ways of doing things. And um, for, the, for the people who have already mastered these 21, you probably can come up with the next 10 or 15 to add to the 21 um, to grow it uh, however, however much you wanna grow it. So I hope you find it useful and um, it maybe stimulates some 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 thinking and some conversations and um, some potentially new and better ways of doing things. Steve, I have one question because I when I looked at the website, um, it 
was a little hard to find when when a congregation wants to start this process mm -hmm. is is it correct they go to the track your progress to begin and and set up the account or where do they first begin to take the assessment right you, know, you do need to set up an account in order to actually use the assessment tool i think you can go through the assessment with you can see the assessment itself without an account but in order for the website to keep track of the 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 uh, uh, how you assess each practice, that's where you need to have your account. And in order to set up the account, you're going to need to be able to have that congregational ID and the password so that it knows that you're kind of an official representative of your congregation. Yeah, I, I I understand that. It's just I wasn't very clear on the website where you put in that information. Um, yeah. Or... It's it's in that area under uh, track progress, and I think that there's. Um, Would you please uh, share your screen? Yeah. Yeah, I'm maybe sorry. you could share it there because I wasn't seeing it easily. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so right now I'm logged in. So, um, and here's, let's see, user profile. Um, so if you have not logged in, you should see some options here for like setting up an account and uh, logging in and that sort of thing. I think if I go to log out, and then if I go back here to track progress, log in, sign up, you should see an option there, okay? And this would be the spot where you where you get started. Do you need a separate account for person representing the congregation or if one person created it 10 years ago, then we should Once... need that person's ID? Uh, once the first person signs up, there is an option that they can invite others to be part of the account. Okay, thank if you. If you think that somebody has set up an account a while ago and you don't know who it is or they moved away or whatever, uh, reach out to me and we can we can get that fixed. So, um, if you can without without logging in or creating an account you can see the uh, assessment tool you just don't have any options to actually click on uh your your uh your assessment of yourself uh and to to tr to track the score that's where doing the login and the sign up are going to help you out okay yeah, I didn't find that on my, our, my end from what I can view, not being on the back side of it, but I did find under track your progress, it has a paragraph that says log in or sign up. So, yeah. Okay. Sorry to ask another question. Is there a printable version or do, do we have to go into each one and print, do, like do a screenshot? It, at the moment, you have, to, when you're on that page, if you do a print to PDF, um you, you you do need to go page by page yeah we haven't built out the functionality yet to do thank that thank you mm -hmm. anybody else well thanks again for being here tonight and thanks for uh, all that you do at your congregations um uh i i know that they wouldn't be what they are without uh the work and the leadership that you provide and so i'm grateful for that and thanks for giving us resources steve it's oh. nice to know these are out there oh you're welcome you're welcome and thank you oh. foundation for paying for it and uh if uh you have any if you think of any questions <laughs> later on um let's see terry did you you're welcome to share my email address uh or okay. you all know how to get in touch with terry so be, between the two of us we should be able to get your questions answered 
I will send out the, an email tomorrow to all those who registered that has both the recording, um, uh, the website for resourceful servants, and then Steve's email address as well. So, but you can always contact me if you have questions. Thanks. Well, sorry. Are we good? Good. All right. Terry, Are you thank good to you. Go? Okay. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Steve. Right. Take care. Right. God bless you. God bless. Thank you both.